Welcome to our show. Uh, this is a conversation about a topic which, if you kind of have your ear to the ground about this kind of thing, maybe you think you know the story, and maybe you do know the story, of Patient HM, which is, in fact, the title uh, of a new book uh, by Luke Dietrich, Patient, Patient HM, A Story of Memory, Madness, and Family Secrets. Particularly if you live here in Connecticut, there's a better chance you know this story because most of it, well, maybe most of it, an awful lot of it takes place in Connecticut. Uh, HM, in fact, was the name of a man, the initials of a man, uh, named Henry, who in fact was from kind of central Connecticut. Uh, his life uh, trajectory took him to various places like Hartford and Manchester and Willimantic and Coventry. And a lot of familiar towns will come up uh, as we discuss uh, where he was or, or if you read Luke Dietrich's book. Um, it's the story uh, of a man who became the most studied patient in the history of neuroscience. Um, the reason that that happened was, in fact, a, a surgery uh, performed on him to help him uh, that instead um, incapacitated him. It, it, well, actually, I shouldn't be telling this story. Uh, the guests should be telling the story. So let's switch over to that. Uh, joining us by phone is, in fact, Luke Dietrich, a journalist and author of Patient HM, a story of memory, madness, and family secrets. In the studio with me uh, is Dr. Hank Schwartz, a psychiatrist and chief uh, vice president for behavioral health at the Institute of Living, Hartford Healthcare and Professor of Psychiatry at UConn School of Medicine. Also with us, uh, Dr. David Glan, Director of Effective Disorders and Psychosis Trials, Olin Neuropsychiatry Research Center at Hartford HealthCare, uh, and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Yale. So we've got a, a lot of firepower here. Um, Luke, uh, since it's your book, I'm going to get you to lead off here. Um, tell us a little bit more about who HM is and why he became so important. Sure. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, but yeah, let me. Uh, I'll, I'll start, I guess, at the at the beginning. What I always consider to be sort of the beginning of of the story of patient HM, which which begins back uh, before he was patient HM, when he was, uh, uh, you know, just Henry Mollison. Um, and to me, and to a lot of people, I think that story begins uh, one evening in the mid 1930s uh, when he was about eight years old, and he was walking home from from a park that a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with, with uh, from uh, Colt, Colt Park, Park in, uh, in, in downtown Hartford. And he was walking home from the playground, uh, and it was uh, July 3rd, I believe, and he was stepped out into the street, and he was knocked down by a, by a bicyclist. Um, the, it, it sort of sent him flying, and he hit his head hard on the ground. It knocked him unconscious for about five, five minutes. He woke up. Um, you know, he had, a, he had a, a, a gash in his head, but otherwise he seemed uh, more or less okay. Um, pretty shortly thereafter, though, he began suffering from minor seizures, and uh, eventually those seizures got progressively worse and worse until um, by his 16th birthday he, was, he started having um, uh, sort of major convulsive seizures. And uh, by his early 20s, he was really severely uh, incapacitated. He was having major seizures almost daily. Um, it was a situation where, you know, his, his, his high school principal wouldn't let him walk across the stage to get the diploma because uh, he was afraid that Henry might have a, have a seizure on stage and, and, you know, cause embarrassment to the, to the whole group. Um, and so it was, it was really sort of, it was very desperate a very desperate situation for Henry and his family. And, you know, in their desperation, they were, they were willing to try almost anything. And ultimately, they turned to, um, uh, to a local neurosurgeon, uh, William Scoville, uh, who had, was the founder and, and director of uh, Hartford Hospital's uh, Department of Neurosurgery. He was, um, you know, quite sort of renowned in his field, uh, by all accounts, a very uh, skilled neurosurgeon. And, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Scoville offered, offered Henry and his family hope in the, in the form of a uh, fairly radical experimental operation. And they, they, uh, chose, to, um, uh, they chose to take that chance. And, uh, and as it turned out, as you mentioned, the, the operation uh, was not entirely successful at, in terms of curing Henry's epilepsy. What its sort of most significant after effect was that it caused uh, Henry to sort of live the rest of his life with a profound uh, amnesia. He sort of lived his life in more or less 30-second increments. The, the, the present would, would constantly slide uh, off of him. Uh, and this was, this was tragic for Henry, but it was ultimately uh, sort of revelatory for 
the field of memory science. A lot of what we know about how memory works uh, came from, uh, you know, the sort of subsequent half century of uh, um, experiments conducted with Henry. Um, so, uh, first of all, a couple of quick things here. So, I mean, for people trying to get kind of a sense of this, uh, and I have the disease of understanding things through popular culture. If you've seen the movie Memento, that probably was based partly on, on Henry. Uh, and uh, it it's maybe gives you kind of a sense of what that sort of snapshot experience uh, of life is like for someone in that position. Um, and I guess the other thing that we should say, because, uh, Luke, we are going to be kind of delving into uh, some of the consequences uh, of this for Henry. I mean, we're already alluding to them that. One thing that you do document your, in your book, although you're 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 pretty tough on uh, this surgeon uh, Scoville, who it turns out to be your grandfather, but that you know they had tried kind of the version of, of the 1953 version of everything, right? They hit him with Dilantin and, and any other drug that they had. It wasn't as though this were was a frivol- frivolously not the last option choice, right? They they kind of had done other things that were less invasive. That's correct. The surgery took place in 1953, but uh, the, Henry uh, consulted with my, with my grandfather, with, with Dr. Scoville, uh, in the mid-1940s um, first. Uh, and for years, they, did, they, they, they tried all sorts of you know, anti-epileptic drugs, and they didn't really help, or they didn't help enough. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was not um, the, first, the, first, the first recourse. Uh, it was after sort of all or, you know, all, all possibilities at the time had more or less been exhausted that they decided to take this, um, this you know, again, fairly radical step. So, um, Hank Schwartz, this is a time, I mean, it is important to put this stuff in the context of its time. Uh, this is a time where things are not as they are, we're not as they are now. Uh, less is known. Uh, and um, uh, Luke has a, a rather felicitous phrase uh, in, his, in his book where it's, it's something to the effect that uh, it's the fate of the uh, broken to illuminate the problems of the unbroken at times. And so um, you do have things being tried which are not tried down. Maybe you could kind of give us sort of a, a, um, a just a general overview of the state of treatment for both neurological and psychiatric disorders at this time. Oh, sure. And certainly the state of treatment was nothing like um, the state of treatment is today. So really the, the best example and the example I'm most familiar with is the application of these kinds of surgeries to patients with specifically psychiatric uh, right. issues, which came along uh, right at, around the same time. Um, and I, I guess in the popular um, imagination, when we think about psychosurgery and lobotomy at, at those times, it stands out um, as a, a terrible thing that, that um, physicians were engaged in. But um, in fact, the options for treatment at, at that time were, were very few. Um, in the early 50s, we were just seeing the very beginning of the introduction of pharmaceutical agents, medications um, that, that could control um, psychiatric symptoms, lithium and Thorazine uh, being amongst the first. <clears throat> but um, th- th- this was coming along slowly. There was what... Uh, Mr. Dietrich calls in the book electroshock therapy, which has turned out to be very effective as electroconvulsive therapy in today's terms, but at at at, at that time was performed without anesthesia and um, somewhat indiscriminately in the sense of kind of knowing what kind of disorders might respond to it. So the he, option he also, he also describes a, a um, and once again this is also being performed at the at the Institute of Living um, a th- kind of therapy where the patient's temperature is raised to quite literally a fever pitch where a, a fever of say 105 and 106 is repeatedly induced in a patient. What was what was the thinking there? Well, the thinking um, there was um, let's try whatever we can try. It was noticed that patients. Um, put in cold wet packs, the opposite of raising the temperature, um, became calmer. Um, People didn't know um, then what was uh, at play. We now know that there's this kind of diving seal reflex that does actually um, calm people. Um, There was thinking that perhaps there were unknown infectious agents that might uh, be at play in some mental illnesses and that heat therapies might might be effective. Um, But in, in essence, they were not terribly effective, though some of the cold uh, therapies were. So the, the options for many people were to spend a life in within an institution. 
Um, and uh, as psychosurgery was introduced, I, you know, I, I think the intention clearly was to provide an option which would enable people to get out of institutional life. We know that depending on the psychosurgical procedure and when in the course of history and the refinement of these procedures, um, some people did very well, but others did very, very poorly. Let me just uh, press on that a little bit, because I I get the feeling reading not only Luke's books, but some of the other literature around this, that, you know, I mean, that psychosurgery was sometimes used for neurosis. You know, neurosis isn't something that would have required the kind of high-powered drugs that you're talking about uh, that didn't exist then. Talk therapy was, you know, not a new thing anymore. So, I mean, it it does seem as though the pervasiveness of the use of psychosurgery, uh, of lobotomies, uh, if it's being used for neurosis, that doesn't even seem explicable by the state of biochemical science at that moment. Well, I'd, I'd have to agree if you're thinking about neurosis in the way that we think about it uh, today. Um, in the 1950s, I guess the, the, and the equivalent diagnosis might have been neurasthenia, which was a term applied generally to people with vague symptoms, but f- for some of whom were, were bad enough that they would wind up institutionalized for, you know, for a long period of time. But there's no question that the procedures were, while effective for some people with very, very disabling uh, disorders who had no other recourse, were applied indiscriminately um, with a kind of therapeutic zeal that far outstripped um, what the procedures had to offer. And we know of, you know, any number of of cases of folks, the the Kennedy's daughter, for instance, or or Mm. sister, who who had, um, you know, very, very poor outcomes. Um, but at the same time, um, as as our author, Luke Dietrich, um, reports in his book, other folks, for instance, um, his grandmother, um, who also underwent um, this procedure, appear to have done uh, very well. Okay, I want to get to the grandmother in just a second here. Um, and as, as you know, Hank, I'm a, a, a basket of neuroses uh, and neurasthenic symptoms. So I'm sensitive about this. These producers around here would give me a lobotomy. If they got a chance in a heartbeat, they would do this. So uh, we'll, we'll, We will stand between them and right. you. I, I want given, this, <laughs> given I want this to options. be the radio equivalent of some kind of advanced directive. I don't want a, lo- I don't want a lobotomy. So, uh, you know, and we're going to jump. I want to come back to um, Luke's grandmother in just a second. But Dr. David Glahn, and I may have uh, misstated your title, professor of psychiatry at, at Yale, um, um, I think it might be worth it just right now to look forward a little bit and just talk about uh, if, in fact, HM is the most studied patient in the history of neuroscience uh, because of, of, in fact, of this rather unique position in which he was rendered. What did we learn from? I mean, how many things do we know as a result of studying HM? So, so HM, um, uh, the, the surgical procedure that took that that was conducted with HM involved um, a resection of of the the medial temporal lobe on on both the left side and the right side, and it included uh, removal of the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, and the amygdala, as well as portions of the parahippocampal gyrus. So, w- what happened, um, as as we've talked about here, is that he when he awoke, he had a profound amnesia, an inability to learn new information. So what what was a, a fundamental shift at that point was that particular brain regions could be engaged in this idea of learning and memory. Um, before, there was a, a distributed model. Um, that is, they, 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 the thought was that memory particularly was being housed in every portion of the brain and what would have – what would be associated with memory loss was just um, a, a significant enough removal of brain and, and that would be associated with memory. Instead, um, now after after HM and, and actually HM, I believe, um, was one of of several surgeries that that took the same kind of procedure. Um, uh, there was this notion that ah, here you have an individual who um, had a normal memory beforehand and suddenly became amnestic. So the 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 initial questions um, had to do and, and had to do with how memory works, and particularly the episodic memory, the ability to remember things about yourself and episodes that you were in. And and that went along for a long way because we, we were able to show that, ah, oh, he can't learn new information, but old information was maintained. 
Right. So um, we, we know from Luke's book, for example, that he could tell that story that Luke told about his diploma, about the fact that he wasn't allowed right. and, and why he wasn't allowed to get his diploma. And, and was it significant that um, I, I don't know how common this was, that he obviously was, you know, a very responsive uh, conversationalist, a very cooperative person. Uh, Luke says as patients go, he was very patient, um, that, that you had a, a person who had been in, in one way profoundly damaged, but also in, uh, incredibly easy to get information out of uh, respecting what information he actually had. Absolutely. And that and that he was someone who even even before his surgery, based based on reports that that I've read and and from uh, and from the the book that we're discussing, um, you know he he was a an amicable individual beforehand as well, right? He was somebody that that went along. He's somebody that um, you know seemed to seemed to be um, uh, an, an an easy to work with individual. Um, what what happened then was that we learned. From from the surgery, we learned that the hippocampus and and these other brain regions seem to be very strongly involved in our ability to learn new information. So that was it. That was one major breakthrough. That was work that was done by a woman uh, named Brenda Milner, um, who who came to do some of the initial assessments of of HM. Um, then then subsequent to that, we began to piece apart. Um, aspects of well, what what is intact and what isn't intact uh, w- with HM, and and that's really what took the the majority of the next forty years or fifty years of work with him, of trying to understand what things changed and what didn't. For example, um, uh, later experiments focused very much on learning procedural uh, activities, so learning to to write backwards or to to to, to write on a maze. Um, or based on a, based on seeing a mirror, and and it was discovered that that he could perform that as well as healthy subjects um, over over time. So there is a type of learning there. Think about it as in the type of learning of playing a piano uh, mm-hmm. piece, right? So there's a piece where you're trying to learn it based on seeing the parts, but then there's a part in which it becomes the motor movement component of it. Mm-hmm. And so what was intact was his ability to do that. And that that was a, 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 a another earth shattering kind of moment in in cognitive neuroscience because it taught us that all memory is not the same that there are differences in within brain of how that type of memory uh, works and so that's another kind of thing that was very important. Um, what what happened after that though is that um, there's been a lot of work that's done post uh, you know in, in addition to the work with HM. And that has helped us kind of understand the different brain regions uh, involved and how they how they worked. Um, you know, the 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 resection that happened with HM I mentioned previously included a number of different brain regions. Um, in subsequent cases, um, the, it it was either uh, due to due to uh, or rarely due to surgical resection, but often due to other types of lesions or hypoxia, uh, hypoxia that. Other brain regions might uh, might be disrupted, and we were able to to get a much better feel for well, which region really is it? Is it really the hippocampus that's the primary effect, or is it the hip, uh, the perihippocampal gyrus? And that type of work continues to this day. Um, uh, but but the 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 profound effects on HM um, uh, immediately stopped that type of bilateral resection. All right. I'm going to just stop you there. And um, I want to say, first of all, that um, Luke's book um, reads uh, very much like an account of the history of one moment in medical science, but also very much like a literary memoir. And it's very much about uh, real people. Scientists are people. They're human beings. Uh, Doctors and surgeons are human beings. They have human qualities. They're not machines. They're not robots. And this comes very much through Luke in your book. So, you know, a lot of us have, in fact, heard other stories about Wild Bill Scoville, the guy who performed this um, this radical lobotomy that that uh, changed HM's life, um, and you know he has kind of a reputation. You document that as kind of a man of action, a man who maybe even seeks out uh, action and thrills. A guy who might arrive uh, in the emergency room or of the hosp- of the neurology ward and say that he'd been, been <laughs> he'd been chased by the police for speeding, and he thought he'd eluded them, but that he wanted them to say the nurses to say that he was now in surgery, performing a radical craniotomy or something. That this is a guy guy who, you know, there's a little bit of a ready fire aim quality to him. Uh, and 
I, I think that's sort of part of his legend. The part of his legend that I had never heard before is the story of your grandmother, who, in fact, was a psychiatric patient at the Institute of Living and kind of, you know, starting in the 1940s. Parallel to this whole story is the story of Bill Scoville dealing with the deterioration and attempt to treat a woman he uh, uh, apparently profoundly loved and cared about and wanted to help. And so how, how does how did that inform in, in your understanding, his his thinking about his role as a doctor treating neurological patients as opposed to psychiatric patients. Right. It was. A, I mean, it was a a huge moment in in my reporting. I think was when I I kind of got access to uh, to some to some of the documents related to my grandmother's institutionalization and sort of. I learned uh, for the first time, really, sort of the details of her of her mental illness um, and and a lot of the details of her treatment. Um, and then also, I mean, I think one of the things that I, I certainly didn't understand coming into the into the beginning of, of stages of writing the book, I, I did not understand the sort of connections between my grandmother's mental illness and uh, my grandfather's ultimate you know, very kind of fervent passion for psychosurgery. Um, I mean, he was one of the most prolific lobotomists ever um, and and a very sort of active proselytizer for the procedure. Um, and I think, uh, it, it, again, it's, it's very difficult to, to sort of, um, uh, you know, a, assign motives to people. Um, but he, he, at least in one letter um, uh, to, to one of his sons, uh, did say that, you know, the, the reason that he was uh, so active in, in, in psychosurgery and in trying to come up with a surgical, you know, fix for mental illness was all for, for E's sake, E being Emily, my grandmother. Um, and so that was, that gave, his, you know, it, it's, it's, it's both poignant and uh, and and troubling uh, to me to think about this sort of personal quest that he was on, um, it, and also you know in in this strange way then it's it's really impossible to understand the the the, the operation that he performed on Henry although Henry's operation was not strictly speaking a psych- psychosurgical mm-hmm. procedure because it, he was he was epileptic he didn't suffer from mental illness it still grew out of um, uh, a, a series of experimental psychosurgical procedures and it was in, in fact identical to procedures that he had previously performed in asylums um, and so there was this odd connection uh, between again and sort of my, my, my grandmother's mental illness being in some ways this sort of, sort of precipitating factor um, that, you know, ultimately led to this decision to perform this radical experimental operation on Henry, which ultimately sort of revolutionized uh, memory science. And I think that connection between psychosurgery and, uh, and Henry's operation is one that you know hasn't hasn't been explored that much, and this also, I mean, as uh, Dr. Schwartz was saying, there was this sort of you know there were certainly this this uh, sort of uh, therapeutic motivations behind ser- uh, psychosurgery, but there were also sort of experimental ones. I mean, I think there was an aspect uh, of kind of experimentalist zeal that was at, at play during the, the, the heyday of psychosurgery that also hasn't been uh, all that well explored, I found. I mean, I, I think one of the, one of the more shocking uh, quotes that, that I uncovered in the course of my research was from a man, another, uh, another neurosurgeon, a man named Paul Busey, who operated out of the um, uh, University of Chicago, um, who was in correspondence with uh, John Fulton, who was the head of uh, the Department of Physiology at Yale University and was in some ways sort of the godfather of the, the intellectual godfather of the, of the lobotomy, you could say. Um, he wrote him a letter after he'd begun performing lobotomies, and he said, uh, you know, uh, he said, man is certainly no poorer as an experimental animal merely because he can talk. And this, this, this was, uh, it, it was an era in which um, all of a sudden operations that had once been limited to animals um, could now be, there was sort of a, a therapeutic rationale for performing them on humans. And you could, you could then, you know, by extension, sort of, you know, uh, see what happened. And, and that led to, you know, it did, it, it certainly in Henry's case, that led to, um, you know, uh, a, a, a revolution in memory science, but at a great human cost, which yeah. 
I just yeah. before we go to a break, I want to ask Hank about this. So there are scenes in in Luke's book um, from the you know from the this distant uh, past and maybe even a past a little bit um, before uh, Scoville surgery on, on HM where you see these things which to my 2016 sensibilities are kind of alarming. You see these patients having these surgeries when they're under locals uh, and and where uh, on one occasion we see uh, a, um, a neurosurgeon performing a surgery uh, where he basically says that he's going to keep moving the instrument until he sees the, the patient's brain disrupted and that, in fact, certain flattenings in her affect and things like that are encouraging to him uh, because it means he's that he's essentially um, scrambling things that need to be scrambled or, or, or changing the brain in a way that it needs to be changed. And he's just sort of listening in real time. There's also a, a similar uh, uh, scene with somebody who has Tourette syndrome where the instrument just keeps moving until this patient stops saying, son of a bitch, son of a bitch, son of a bitch. I, I, I'm assuming the protocols are different now and and that you just couldn't get that kind of surgery done half as therapy and half as an experiment it seems that that just it just doesn't get off the launch pad anymore yeah i think the um operative um phrase there was your 2016 sensibilities Mm -hmm. uh, because uh certainly these kinds of things could not happen by today's standards i mean at the time therapeutic zeal and research were ambiguously joined um, and controls over research you know, really came much later. It, was, it wasn't until 1947 that the Nuremberg Code was uh, issued uh, as a result of the Nuremberg trials and, and learning about Nazi research on human subjects. And it wasn't um, you know, until the 1960s that our you know, kind of current concepts of informed consent for research led to the development of institutional review boards, uh, for instance, and strict federal regulations and a, and a, a major shift in our thinking about um, what kind of behaviors on the part of surgeons uh, and physicians um, was uh, acceptable um, and sharp distinctions between the research world and treatment. Um, I'm, we're going to take a break right now. We're talking uh, with three different guests about one book, uh, Patient H.M., A Story of Memory, Madness, and Family Secrets by Luke Dietrich. I do want to quickly say before we go to break, it's, it's amazing reading this book like here because, I mean, we're sitting, I'm sitting right now just a few miles from where the surgery was performed, from where the institute is. Luke's grand, I bike past Luke's grandmother's uh, house on North Steel Road uh, all the time. Uh, it just, uh, it's a very profoundly, con- and of course, H.M. himself is just, it was all over Connecticut in the course of his life. So um, it's, a, it's an amazing book to read uh, sitting right here. Uh, we'll take a little break and we'll come back. And we're back. We're here with Luke. Uh, Luke Dietrich is joining us by phone, journalist and the author of Patient H.M., A Story of Memory, Madness, and Family Secrets. Also in studio with me is Dr. Harold Hank Schwartz, psychiatrist-in-chief, VP for Behavioral Health at the Institute of Living, uh, and uh, professor of psychiatry at a UConn School of Medicine. Dr. David Glahn, director in, of Affective Disorders and Psychosis Trials at Olin Neuropsychiatry Research Center, Hartford Healthcare, and professor of psychiatry um, at Yale. Um, Dr. David Glahn, it's, it's, you know, to read this book, and once again, as Hank says, and as I say, with my 2016 sensibilities, I find myself occasionally getting frustrated and maybe even angry uh, at Luke's uh, grandfather. Um, and I, I don't, maybe it's important to just talk about the fact that some of these people doing these surgeries that do seem glaringly out of sync with our value system right now, uh, by and large, and I think this is a point that Luke makes, they weren't evil mad scientists, bad guys, they were people who really were very, very focused on the idea of, of healing people. I don't know. It's, I find that so hard to reconcile with some of the things that I find them doing now. So um, I would agree. And there, there's pretty much no way you can't agree with, with that kind of statement because you're looking at um, in, uh, the difficulty of first do no harm, but comparing that to the, the question of um, I have to do something. Mm-hmm. And and I and I believe that that's part of where the zeal comes from. Um, that that notion that it's very easy for us uh, to say, ah, well, you know, we had other alternate routes or there are other treatments that were available. But at the time, you had people that were basically 
put into uh, you know into a, a treatment facility and never had any possible uh, option for going for going anywhere else. Um, and the level of treatment that we could have for them was so small. So I, I understand that zeal at the level of really a true desire to do good um, for the for the patients that were there. Um, you know, certainly, certainly there is the potential that uh, that that the zeal um, for uh, for this clinical work could go well beyond um, what we would what we today would think would be wise, and and possibly even beyond what at the time people some people were thinking was was the right thing to do. Um, but you know, we're now looking back at it and trying to understand um, not simply what they what they learned, but also different ways that that um, that we could move forward. I mean, one of the things that that is kind of interesting here is that the the uh, the removal of portions of brain is still one of our primary um, and or at least last resort treatments of epilepsy. And particularly now we know you only do it on one side. There's only unilateral uh, surgical procedures. And we spend a lot of time trying to find where's the seat of the seizure um, and then remove that that brain. Part of that comes from the experiences of, of, of Henry and his surgery and what happened to him afterwards, that we realize that you can't do a bilateral surgery of this kind in this area. And so even today, there are still Im- clinical implications, not simply the, our understanding of memory, but clinical implications of the kind of work that was going on then, e- even if it, 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 to our current sensibilities, seems to be so difficult for us to understand. You know, I want there's something I want all three of you to talk about, but I'm I'm going to start with you. So th- there, are, there's all the conversation that we're just having about everything that led up to um, the radical lobotomy surgery uh, performed on HM. But then there's this his status as a patient afterwards, is, which is a fascinating thing too. Here's this guy who is this treasure trove uh, of potential avenues of research, and he's not just now he's not just potential; it's a realized potential in many cases. But now what you've got is a patient who is conscious who is volitional in a lot of ways, who's able to um, talk about himself and act on his own behalf in certain, in certain ways. But you start wondering about the question of informed consent now, too. Uh, I mean, there's a question of informed consent before surgery. Now there's a question of informed consent afterwards. This is a guy who's essentially going to agree to be studied for decades and decades and decades. I don't know. What did you conclude ultimately uh, about this part of the story? Right. So I, I do think that informed consent is one of these themes that, that plays out throughout, throughout this, this story. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd actually argue that, the, that, that there isn't really a serious question of informed consent when it comes to Henry's operation itself, mm-hmm. although I would slightly take uh, issue with the idea that um, it was only after Henry's uh, surgery that, that that epilepsy surgeons knew not to go bi- bilaterally. I'd, I'd say that, you know, the, the chief epilepsy surgeon at the time, uh, worldwide really, was a guy named Wilder Penfield uh, at the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, and he would never, uh, you know, perform his operations bilaterally. Um, he, he sort of plays a, plays a part in the book. Um, my grandfather's decision to actually go bilaterally in Henry's case um, was, I think, certainly in even even by the standards of the time, by uh, the standards of 1953, was a questionable one. Um, but in terms of informed consent, Henry was, you know, in desperate straits. Uh, he was an adult, and he chose to have that operation, and he certainly understood that there were some risks, even though those risks were not, you know, foreseen ultimately by anybody. Um, I would say that that in, in the cases of a lot of the psychosurgeries that led up to Henry's operation, uh, uh, you you know these there were real sort of egregious and and profound violations of informed consent. Although, as Dr. Schwartz point, pointed out, uh, you know informed consent was sort of a work in progress at the time. Um, uh, although, again, you know Nuremberg Code 1947, a lot of these things happened after 1947, um, and you know the the, uh, the our modern concept of informed consent doesn't differ too much from the first point of the Nuremberg Code. Um, but in terms of Henry's experience as a research subject post-operatively, um, that. Uh, 
in in in, in my research, um, I, I think that there definitely are serious questions to be raised about whether um, informed consent was adhered to in his case, um, because certainly in during you know the the last decades of his life, um, it was not only this sort of you know concept from the Nuremberg Code, but it was sort of legally enshrined, and there were rules and regulations, and it does seem like though in some cases those were uh, skirted. Um, he, uh, bet- for, there was a period of, of, you know, 12 years, for example, uh, between 1980 and 1992, when uh, Henry was the only person uh, signing his informed consent forms uh, for the, the research that, that was conducted with him. Um, as Dr. Glan pointed out, the surgery removed not just his hippocampus, but also his amygdala. And one of the effects of sort of uh, uh, amygdala ablation is uh, to, to render a, a person sort of more passive, more docile, more tractable. And so you become then sort of neurologically predisposed to consent to almost anything uh, when you don't have an amygdala. You combine that with this sort of profound amnesia that really, I mean, it's going to be hard for him to even remember the end of a, of a, of a, of a form by the, by the time he um, uh, gets to it. And you really have, have a patient that it's hard to argue is capable of consenting on his own. Uh, after that, he received a, a conservator, who, uh, a court-appointed conservator, who had claimed to be Henry's closest living relative. It turns out he was not. Henry's closest living relatives were never consulted. Um, and there, uh, you know, I could go on. There were a lot of issues related to informed consent in Henry's case. All right. Um, well, before we run out of time here, and there's some other things we want to talk about, I want to give everybody else a chance to talk a little bit about this. So, Hank Schwartz, this is a complicated area, right? I mean, you've got some somebody who you're studying him because of, you know, what we would crudely maybe call a mental defect. So then there are questions about whether uh, he can participate in informed consent about his own handling. I I think on the face of it, somebody who can't remember uh, anything, any new information beyond 30 to 60 seconds or so cannot give informed consent by today's standards um, of judging informed consent. No question. And for years, uh, as uh, Luke Dietrich points out, um, he was signing his own consent. When a conservator ultimately was appointed, it was kind of under questionable circumstances. So I think that that is a clearly an ongoing issue um, in, you know, in this story. An- another element of the informed consent is, is the concept of the balance of risks and benefits. Um, that did change how we would interpret risks and benefits and how um, whether the patient um, was to determine them on the basis of his own background and feelings or on the basis of the amount of information that a reasonable doctor would provide, that all settled out uh, through the 50s, 60s, and 70s in a series of court cases, which have led to a current regulatorily um, uh, driven um, rules and regulations about informed consent that didn't exist um, in 1953. Um, However, Um, There were clearly surgeons um, at the time who, without regulations telling them that the the risks of surgery have to be outweighed clearly by its its benefits, believed that. And these were people who would not engage in psychosurgery um, and and were opposed to it. So there, uh, you know, there clearly was uh, getting back to the Wild Bill concept. Um, there were notions of individual values and personality factors at play um, um, in the provision of these kinds of procedures um, that um, were, you know, very very variable according to the doctor and the doctor's choice um, at a time when regulation was really just growing. We're going to take a quick break. We have uh, one more set of issues we want to get into here. So we'll take that break. We'll come back and finish up the show. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kion Wolf, with help from Patrick Scahill. All of our shows are available on wnpr.org slash Colin, on our Facebook page, and on Stitcher, iTunes, and TuneIn. On tomorrow's show, The Circus, not this political season. And now... <laughs>
back to Colin. So we're talking uh, today about the story of Patient HM, which is also the title of Luke Dietrich's new book, uh, it's, uh, subtitled The Story of Memory, Madness, and Family Secrets. The family secrets have to do with the fact that the man who p- performed uh, the surgery uh, on HM that created uh, the uh, impaired memory forming condition, which then told the rest of the story of HM's life, the man who did that surgery is uh, Luke's grandfather. Also, very poignant story of Luke's grandmother as well. Uh, and uh, in studio with me is uh, Dr. Harold Hank Schwartz, psychiatrist in chief and vice president for behavioral health at the Institute of Living, professor of psychiatry at UConn School of Medicine, and Dr. David Glan. Glan, these guys, you have long titles. So I'm going to skip over some of them. Uh, professor of psychiatry at Yale. So, um, you know, Luke um, Dietrich, Dietrich uh, when you have a book out. Um, this is an immensely readable book, and uh, I've been fascinated by it, and there are a lot of local tie-ins, as I was saying. And, in fact, um, both your grandmother and uh, Suzanne Corkin, the person we're going to talk about next, uh, went to Oxford School. I went to Kingswood School. They were uh, sister and brother schools. They're merged together now. Uh, but your book is creating some news here, too, and it's news uh, that it's always good for an author if there's news, but there's uh, news in the form of pushback, too, particularly as regards your uh, depiction of Suzanne Corkin, one of the researchers who worked with HM, taking over from Brenda Milner uh, at MIT. Uh, uh, David Glan talked about her uh, um, earlier. Um, and so there have been some um, claims that, um, that, that you were, uh, among other things, that you talk about the f- possibility or the probability that uh, she uh, destroyed before her death um, some raw data relating to HM. Uh, there are some other uh, things in the book about kind of a, um, a spat or a dispute uh, about ownership of uh, the brain tissue of HM. But um, can you just talk a little bit about the kind of pushback you've been getting lately? There are um, some other researchers and scientists who are upset about this part of the book. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I started getting pushback. Uh, the book was excerpted in the New York Times Magazine uh, a week before um, it, the book itself came out. And uh, so I, I, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a letter signed by, by 200 neuroscientists that came out a couple days after the, the book excerpt was published, um, basically pushing back at my depiction of Suzanne Corkin. Um, and uh, I, I can't say I'm, you know, entirely surprised uh, that it would receive pushback. Um, I, I mean, it's uh, it it isn't uh, sort of the depiction of I, I think the story of patient H M uh, that people are used to reading, um, and I think that there are troubling aspects to the story um, and troubling aspects to the way that the research was conducted that that um, that were brought up in the book that certainly you know ruffled feathers in the in the, in the neuroscience community. Um, I will say though that you know everything everything that's been sort of controversial. You you, you mentioned for example. Um, uh, the question of whether raw data was was shredded uh, by Suzanne Corkin, um, you know, that is something that comes directly from my interview with Suzanne Corkin. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's it's her words that I'm that I'm using, and th- those I even you know, in in response to the pushback, hmm. I, uh, I I I put a, a, an audio recording of, yeah. of uh, that portion of, of my interview with her online. In fact, Luke, uh, Luke we have a little bit of that audio. We're just going to play it right now. Well, the tests are gone. The test data, the data sheets are gone because the stuff is published. Uh huh. Most of it is published, or a lot of it is published. But not all of it, and also I, I, I that, that, anyway, I find that I find well, that pretty surprising. Well, the things that aren't published yeah. are, you know, experiments that just didn't go right. Or didn't, you know, there was a problem with them, like he had a seizure or something like that, or. Um, but you know, even what's published, I mean, as as you know, I mean, you look at you you look at the papers, and the papers, in some sense, are the tip of each paper is kind of you know the tip of this iceberg of the work that was done, and the work that was done, you know, all that all that data floating around underneath. It seems to me that so much of that would be valuable to preserve, that people really may well want to go back and review. And there's no place to preserve it. There's no place to preserve it. Not I mean, not at MIT or. I mean, how, how many files are we talking here? I mean, what would are we talking about? You know, a storeroom like this full of boxes of papers, or no, not that much. No, but they're mostly at. Are they mostly at your home now? 
Some some of it was. Uh, no, not now. Okay. It isn't. No. It's just in storage somewhere, or. Uh, most of it is has gone. Is in the trash. It was shredded. Most of it was already shredded. Yeah. Yeah. Just recently, or. Yeah, when I moved. When you moved, you shredded it. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, and so what's and 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 what is left? Most of it you're planning to shred. Um, probably. Um, Dr. David Glenn, I've been having an emailing back and forth with a neuroscientist that I know and respect who um, uh, I think is probably uh, on the side of the people who are raising some questions uh, about uh, this part of Luke's book. On the other hand, this is kind of a ch- – I mean, I don't know. I'm just not familiar with the, with what's being described here. I mean, how out of the ordinary does it sound to you? Um, it, it depends a little bit on exactly what kind of information you're talking about. If you're, you're talking about um, the shredding of, of notes that were taken – at a, at a certain point when you were working on, a, on an experiment that were just sort of a rough notes kind of thing, it's common for that, that type of information to not be maintained. If what you're talking about is actually data, so information that's specifically about, uh, about the information, about the, the subject or their performance or something along those lines, that, it's very rare to actually have that shredded um, or to, to remove that. Um, you know, currently most information um, has a has a has a shelf life right so if we if we do a, a, an experiment at this time there's a certain period of time that that we maintain that information because that's what the the uh, institutional review board specifies and then after that time it, it is often destroyed um, but HM is a very special case right Mo- most of the people that were, were you know are coming through are fairly are, are typical. Um, and and may not be the kinds of people that we want to keep an archive forever. Um, I, I will I will point out that in, in a letter from written written by um, Dr. Corkin's um, chairman, that he specified that actually none of the information was actually shredded, and that and that he doesn't really understand why um, why that that she she answered that way in the interview. Um, I. I don't. I don't know the validity of, of one of those cases versus the other because obviously it's not it's not primary source for me, right? I'm I'm mm-hmm. hearing it just the way that that you are, um, but I would be surprised, given that this, uh, that that Dr. Corkin had really spent her entire academic life working on this uh, and and with working with HM um, in order to produce the kinds of. Of of information that we that we as a scientific community were, were looking for, so there, there's something going on here. Exactly where it is is, is unclear to me. Um, uh, w- what's happening? But it certainly would be unusual. Um, you know, once again, this is like a four hour conversation. We've got two minutes left, saying Hank. So I apologize for putting you in that that state. But I would assume the scientific community community is going to want to investigate this a little bit more. My antennae, which are very uneducated antennae, go up when I hear her say, "Well, there were some experiments that didn't go right." Um, in general, we want to know about those experiments too. Well, sure. Well, by by they didn't go right, does that mean that the experiments did not actually uh, prove the hi- the hypothesis, or did that mean that they were you know just interrupted by an epileptic? seizure or whatever, we certainly would want to know that. Um, I am not the scientist that Dr. Glan is, so I, I almost have a, a lay medical view of this. But if it is true that um, and that basic data was uh, destroyed, I, I would find that kind of shocking behavior. There was a time uh, 25 years ago when I did some research, and I still have that basic data in my file uh, tucked away in a, in, an, in a rarely used bathroom at the Institute of Living. Yeah, the stuff about me, by the way, you can now shred. Um, <laughs> all right, we have to stop here. This is I, I'm, I'm sorry because there's this is a long conversation even about this part of the book, and there's uh, there's just acres of this book that we're not talking about. So, so read the book. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, thanks so much to Luke Dietrich, uh, author of Patient HM: Memory Madness and Family Secrets, and thanks so much to Dr. David Glan, professor of psychiatry at Yale, and Dr. Harold Hank Schwartz, psychiatrist in chief the Institute of Living. Uh, They have much longer titles, but then we'll be completely out of time if I uh, give them all. Of course, it is great to have a producer who is a nurse, and I do, Betsy Kaplan. So, Betsy Kaplan, thanks for all the hard work and research and making me sound at least a tiny bit smarter than I actually am. What the heck are we doing with the rest of it? Well, you got a brain to use it, you don't want to refuse it, it's a better... Pull yourself 
You can't keep causing all the problems in the world when you're leaving your brain on the shelf. 